Good morning, everyone. How are you? Roy is very cheerful this morning and eager to say hi. I also want to start out, I've got a lot of shout outs for you. So what are we on? Day six of our Titanic read aloud? Yes. Um, so I've heard from a lot of you. So here are my shout outs for today. Hello. Well, uh, hello to all of you. So I'm shouting out to everyone, but here's special mention of Nora and Will, Team Ski, Sophia, Amelia, Franklin and Jaden, Mrs. Manny's third graders, Mrs. Rankin's readers, the students of Clifton Schools, Jocelyn, Caitlin and Ryan, Mrs. Brickwood's fourth graders, Savannah, Matthew, Evan and Owen, Mrs. Wheat's second and third graders, Adam and Becca, Noah, the kids of Kinnerly Elementary, the kids of Rama C. Page Elementary, Mrs. Ford and Mrs. McDermott's fourth graders, and Mrs. Lesko's second graders. So there are my shout outs for today, and I'm very excited to read. We're gonna start today with chapter 11. My recap is, as we left off with, with um, we had George and Aunt Daisy having to go down to third class in search of Phoebe. Um, and they met up with their with George's old friend Marco and little Enzo, who's very loud. Um, and Enzo had dragged George to see something. He kept saying, see, 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 and George wasn't sure what he meant. What he meant was the sea, the sea, that the sea was filling the Titanic up. So that's where we left off with George realizing that something very, very bad was happening on the Titanic. Okay, so now we're gonna start reading chapter 11 of I Survived the Sinking of the Titanic. Unsinkable, unsinkable. George whispered those words like a prayer over and over in his mind. He thought of Mr. Andrews, of how sure he was of this ship, but the longer George stared at that water, that foaming green water rising higher every second, the more certain he became the Titanic was in trouble. We must go up, Marco said to Aunt Daisy. We find a way. But she shook her head, holding up Phoebe's bright blue coat and her life jacket. My niece, Phoebe, Aunt Daisy said, she's down here. George could see she was fighting back tears. George had never seen her look so sad and helpless, not even when Uncle Cliff died. She came down here looking for me, George said. We can't find her. Marco's amber eyes became very intent. An idea, he said. He knelt down and spoke to Enzo in Italian. The boy smiled and nodded. Then Marco hoisted the little boy up onto his shoulders. Enzo took a huge breath and screamed, Phoebe! Phoebe! People stopped talking and stared up at the little boy with the foghorn voice, Phoebe! Phoebe! As a hush fell over the crowd, George heard a faint voice, I'm here! I'm here! The crowd parted and Phoebe appeared, her spectacles crooked, her face pale. She staggered forward and threw her arms around George, burying her face in his chest. I found you, she whispered. George didn't bother arguing over who did the finding. And anyway, his words were stuck in his throat, so he just held her tight. It took some time for Phoebe to calm down enough to tell her story, that yes, she had been looking for George and heading for the baggage hold, that she got caught in the crowd of people rushing toward the back of the ship. It was like a stampede, she said. As Phoebe talked, Aunt Daisy held, helped her into her coat and life jacket. Enzo held Phoebe's hand like they were old friends, and the strange thing was that it felt that way, like they'd know Marco and Enzo forever. Maybe that's what happened when you got trapped in a flooding ship together. George started to feel calmer with Phoebe close to him. And then came a deep, but then came a deep booming sound, a kind of groaning that echoed up all around them. At first, George thought maybe the engines had started up again, but no, this was not, wasn't the sound of the Titanic's mighty engines. The entire ship catapulted forward. People fell, toppling like dominoes. George was thrown into the wall. Screams and shouts echoed through the hallway. He managed to grab Enzo by the life jacket as he went sailing by him. Enzo just giggled and fell onto George's lap. To him, this was a fun game. George hoped he'd never figured out that it wasn't. What was that, Phoebe gasped, digging her fingers into George's arms. Nobody answered, but they all knew the Titanic 
was sinking. We will go up, Marco said. How, Aunt Daisy said. Phoebe grabbed George's hand. You, Georgie, she said. What, George said. Phoebe's right, Aunt Daisy said. You know the ship better than anyone. She turned to Marco. He's explored every inch. George couldn't believe it. They were counting on him? But what if he made a mistake? What if they all got lost? You can do it, Phoebe said. And so George closed his eyes, was picturing Mr. Andrews' blueprints in his mind. And he remembered the escape ladders. He remembered what Mr. Andrews had told him. The ladders are in the stoker's quarters and they run up three decks. He pointed toward the front of the ship. This way, he said. Chapter 12. There were no, there was no crowd here, just abandoned trunks and suitcases and water. It was seeping into the hallway from under the doors of some of the cabins. No wonder those people were trying to push their way upstairs. They probably known right away that the ship was in trouble and the bottom decks were flooding. The door to the stoker's quarters was locked. Marco handed Enzo over to George and rammed the door with his shoulder, breaking the lock. George rushed inside and went to the back of the wall. It went to the back wall, and there it was, a ladder bolted to the wall, just like Mr. Andrews said there would be. It came through the floor and shot straight up through the opening in the ceiling. George almost laughed with relief. Bravo, George, Marco said. Bravo, Giorgio, Enzo said, clapping. George hopped onto the ladder with Phoebe and Aunt Daisy at his heels. George was worried about Enzo, but the little guy scrambled like a monkey right ahead of Marco. They came up in a small dining room meant for crew members, and then George let everyone down a long second-class corridor, up the grand staircase, and finally out onto the crowded boat deck. Here's a picture. They made it. An officer came carrying over to Aunt da hurrying over to Aunt Daisy. Madam, there's a lifeboat about to leave. You and the children must come at once. The man looked at Marco. Women and children only, sir, he said somberly. I'm afraid you will have to stay with the other gentlemen. Marco nodded. Yes, he said, I know. Phoebe had been right. There weren't enough lifeboats. Not nearly enough. What would happen to all these men on the deck? There were hundreds of them. And what about the crew and those people down on G-deck? George's heart was pounding so hard he thought it would break through his chest. He felt dizzy and sick. Marco got down on his knees and spoke very quietly to Enzo. Enzo nodded. Marco kissed him on the forehead and then Enzo ran over to Aunt Daisy. She picked him up. I said he will go on a special boat ride, Marco said. I said you will not leave him. Aunt Daisy nodded, her eyes welling up with tears. I promise you that, she said. Marco and Aunt Daisy looked at each other. Neither of them said a word, but a whole conversation seemed to happen in their eyes. Phoebe really was crying now, looking away so Enzo wouldn't see. George felt like someone was choking him. Come on now, an officer screamed. And so they left Marco, and when George turned around just a few seconds later, he was gone. The officer led them through a crowd of men to the side of the ship where a lifeboat hung just over the side. It was packed with people women and children, except for two sailors who stood at either end. An officer helped Phoebe over the rail, and then one of the soldiers reached over and pulled her into the boat. George helped Enzo, who tumbled in next to Phoebe. Aunt Daisy had a hard time climbing over in her, her skirts, but George held her hand, and she finally made it. Now it was George's turn. As he took a step over the railing, someone pulled him back roughly. No more room, the officer said. Women and children only. Lower away, he called. No, called Aunt Daisy, standing up in the boat. He's only 10 years old. Wait. The lifeboat rocked and almost tipped over. Ladies shrieked. You will drown us all, a woman shouted. Sit down or I'll throw you over, the sailor said roughly. And now Phoebe was screaming too. Enzo howled. Jock was too, George was too shocked to move. Phoebe leapt up and grabbed up hold one of the ropes. She was trying to climb out of the lifeboat back to George. He gasped as her hand slipped and she dangled over the sea. A sailor grabbed her around the waist and threw her into the boat. And then the boat slid down the ropes and splashed into the water. Aunt Daisy and Phoebe were shouting up at him as the sailors rowed the boat away. George stood there at the rail watching his entire body shaking. He stood there for what felt like a long time after the boat disappeared into the darkness. He couldn't look down at the water, so he stared up at the sky, at all those stars. He closed his eyes and told himself it was a nightmare. He really wasn't. He was really asleep in his suite. 
Oh no, or no, he was home on the farm in his bed with Phoebe sleeping across the room and Papa sitting downstairs by the fire. He closed his eyes tighter. He tried to block out the terrible noises around him. He felt himself tipping to the side and he held tighter to the rail and then he couldn't hold on any longer. His hand slipped and George fell, smashing his head on the deck. And then there was silence. So that's the end of chapter 12, and I'll, I'll read chapter 13 tomorrow, but I just wanted to show you guys something. I think I mentioned in one of my videos that, because of course I wasn't able to visit the Titanic because it sank in 1912, and now it's on the bottom of the North Atlantic, um, there were ways for me to try to learn more about the ship and try to picture it so that when I was writing, I could imagine my characters, what they were going through. So I showed you earlier this book of blueprints, but I think I mentioned that the movie Titanic, which some of you might have seen, um, was also a really amazing source of information for me because George Cameron, I'm sorry, James Cameron, who directed the movie, did so much research. And he and um, another man whose name was, I think, Jim Marshall, I'll check on that for you, um, they did just an incredible amount of exploration um, into the history of the Titanic and the building of the ship so that they were able to recreate almost every single detail of the ship. So when I described, for instance, how George and Enzo and Phoebe and Marco and Aunt Daisy came up that ladder and came onto the crowded boat deck, this is what they would have come up into. Though this is a scene from the movie, but this is very accurate in terms of how people would have looked and how that ship would have, the deck would have looked, what kind of clothing and what the life vests would have looked like because uh, Jim Cameron was so kind of just a real maniac about getting the details right. And then in the, the lifeboats, I can show you um, again that uh, these were very accurate as to what the actual lifeboats of the Titanic looked like. And there were pictures there. He was able to, to bring these um, to life because there are some photographs of um, a lot of the aspects of the Titanic. And there are, um, you know, again, those bl blueprints that I showed you. So he must have spent, you know, I think years really um, researching everything. So I can show you more of this tomorrow. This is actually kind of fascinating because this is the script of that movie. So I've really um, enjoyed exploring this. I could keep you here all day, but I know you guys have a lot to do. Um, enjoy, enjoy this day. Um, hi to all of you again, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for more reading. Bye-bye.